Would you carry this outside with me? Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Would you carry this outside with me? Yes. And then when I get outside, you'll give it back. <coughs> Will you take this one outside for me? And then when we get outside, you can give it back to me. Will you take this outside for me when we go outside? And then when we're outside, you can give it back to me. Okay. Thank you. Can you take this outside for me? We're going to walk outside. And then when we're outside, there will be a time when you give it back to me. Can you take this outside for me? We're going to walk outside <laughs> together, and then you'll see. And then, and then at a certain point, you'll give it back to me. Oh, no, don't take it out right now. <laughs> oh, keep it until... Can you take it with me outside? Yeah. Can you take this outside for me? Um, we're going to go together, and then when we get outside, I'll ask you to give it back to me. Okay? So when you see me walk outside, you can just come with me. In a minute, we're going to walk outside. Um, and can you carry that outside for me? Sure. And then when we get outside, there will be a moment when I ask you to give it back. Okay. Hey. So, in a minute, we're going to, can you, can you keep that and then give it back to me when we go outside? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. In a minute, we're going to walk outside. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Can you take this outside with us? And then, and then there will be a time when I ask you to give it back. Hey, friends. Can you take this outside for me? Yeah. And then there will be a time when we're outside when I'll ask you to give it back. Okay. Like hide? Oh. I don't have to go right now. No, you'll, we'll all go together. Okay. Ready to go? Ready to go? Are we ready to go outside? Can you take this one outside for me? Can you take this outside for me? Take and the, Take this outside for me. We're going to go outside. Okay, yeah. And then there will be a time when I ask you to give it back. Okay. Sure.
I'm just gonna breathe for a minute. I invite you to breathe too. <laughs> so thank you all for coming out tonight to The Unsettlement, Dad. Um, it's been a year, well, it's been many, many, many years, I think, to get to this point standing here with all of you. And I don't think of it as like the end of this process, but just one kind of point in the process. Um, but it's also like a process that's been really intense on a lot of levels. And so I wanted to come out here um, because The Unsettlements has been a series of um, work that I've been doing beginning last year um, in September. Um, and each one of those unsettlements, of which there's now eight in the show and there's six more that aren't in the show. Um, and each one of those unsettlements um, is linked to a site. Um, and uh, in the show, it's kind of referenced in many different ways. Um, but so we're in one of those sites. Right? This is one of those sites that's in the show. Um, yeah, and it's the, kind of the first time that I've invited like a group of people to go to one of those sites with me. And so it feels really meaningful. Um, my parents have been out to some of the sites with me to do the work of the unsettlements. Um, have you been to any of the sites with me? No. Um, I don't know if anyone else besides my parents has been to any of the sites. I have a very poor memory. Um, and ever since I started the residency here at Lawndale nine months ago, I have looked out those windows and like obsessed with this square. Um, and I did a bunch of research to figure out what was here what that history was. Some of that research was in the archives. Some of that research was talking to my mom and dad. Um, and some of that research ended up being this whole long process of trying to get, um, trying to talk to the owners of the site. Um, so the owners of the site right now are 10 individuals from a white, Anglo-Saxon family, Anglo-Saxon family here in Houston. Um, and this site, as any of you know who come to Lawndale, gets used in really weird ways. It tends to be a place where like tow trucks come up and are dealing with cars. It's a place where there's like people gather under the trees. It's a place where people bike by really slowly. It's a place where People drive up a lot on the site with their air conditioning on and take a break from the day. Um, when there's car accidents, a lot of times they bring the wrecked cars on here. Um, so I've seen a lot of those things um, and I've learned a lot about what was here on the site. And I learned more things about my dad through the stories that he told me about things that happened here and things that he remembers from here. Um, so I sent emails to the woman who is uh, the caretaker for the property. So there's 10 owners who are all members of the same family. But this 95-year-old woman is the one who has kind of say over what happens. Um, and so I invited her over for a tea in my studio. She said no, and then she said yes, and then she canceled. And then I canceled because I had to do something with my daughter something I don't remember bad memory again and then and then she canceled because it was the winter and it was too cold and she's 95 and that's when I found out she was 95 so I didn't know she was 95 at the beginning and I found out she was 95 and of course a 95 year old woman doesn't want to come out in the cold to walk around the site right or to sit in my studio so I said oh I can go to your house like I'll go to you she said okay I'll let you know once the cold is over da, da, da. So then come spring, I kept looking out at the site and this square, and by that time I decided, or I thought that it would be really wonderful to weed it. Like weed all of it out. Didn't know why, 
I'm a gardener. I really like working in the garden. And so I thought there was just something about it where I was like, oh, I want to just weed it. Didn't know why. Um, and then I met, I started thinking about what was under here, knowing some of those layers of history of things that have been on this site. And, and none of the other unsettlements do I, do I dig. Um, the only things that I do at the sites is walk around, look a lot, listen, observe, sit, kind of wander. I take photos, I take videos, take Instagram stories. Some of y'all have probably seen the Instagram stories that I take. Um, I know you have, Yuka. <laughs> um, and, and that's about it. That's all I really do there. I collect the objects and bring the objects back from the sites and I bring them to my studio and then assemble them into these things that I call object poems and that we'll talk about more in a minute. The point being, I didn't know why I wanted to dig here. I didn't know why I wanted to weed it. And this whole process has just been about following my gut and following my intuition about like what I need to do with that site. Each one of the sites is really different. They all have their own needs and wants and their own really complicated relationships to my family and to the city. And it, so it feels important to honor those complexities and not um, force the same procedures to be done on the same space. Because each one of those spaces my relationship, my relationship to it in my own queer, white, positioned in its own way body has its own very particular relationship to it. So it's been, over the course of this year, has just been a process of thinking about what can be done at those sites. So in any case, this one, I decided I wanted to dig, I decided I wanted to weed. And so in, see cars driving up, um, in September, no, it, a couple months ago then, I was like, oh, I, I let the owner go. I forgot to follow up with her. And so I followed up and said, you know, I'd still really like to meet. And then I said in that short email, I'd really like to meet because I really want to do an artistic intervention on the site. She immediately responded within like a few hours and said, I have called enough of the other owners of the site to know that no one wants you to do an artistic intervention on the site. I'm very sorry. That's it. I was a little upset. It's like, we didn't even get our tea. We didn't get our coffee. Like, so I responded back in a long email. I mean, long for me, like three paragraphs, little paragraphs, and just said like, oh, that's, that's really sad. I'm really, really sad about that. Hi. I'm really sad about that. Um, and just to let you know what I was thinking, my family's been here for seven generations. My family's German, Texas family that's been here for a long time. My father has these memories of things that happened here on, the, on your property. And so I was really interested in collecting objects that most people would see as trash from the site. Um, and this is a good time if you could bring up the objects that people see as trash. Um, and if you, can just, if you can just place them in the hole. And I'll keep talking. You can, yeah. Um, and so I told her that, that I collected objects from the site that other people see as trash. And I wanted to take some photographs and some videos. And, um, and it was really interesting. She, also immediately got back to me and said, she said, I really wish you had told me that before. I was like, right, like I wanted to tell you that sitting down with tea, like human beings that speak to one another, not like an artist requesting property owner's approval for artistic intervention. But since it's come to this, like that's it. And she said, oh, I really wish you had told me this before. Um, my family also has been here for many generations. We're also Germans who came here in the 1840s. I wish you'd told me that. As if like our ethnic and generational connections would have changed that from the beginning if I had just mentioned, if I had led with that, that would have been better. But she told me, but I'll talk to the other owners and I'll get back to you. And so I said, okay. And she never got back to me. But the night of the opening, 
um, I get a text from this archaeologist, Roger Moore, who Laura and her friend Lily Cox Richard had introduced me to in a panel at Diverse Works. And, um, and Roger had come out, he's the archaeologist who's done all of this work with Textad, and he's like, did the archaeology on all the stadiums when they were built. He's, he knows a million things. And he, um, so he had come to my studio and visited to talk about the digging and what an archaeological dig would mean and what it would do and how I would do that. And, um, and we just talked about what things you find in the dirt and what might be there and, and also about whiteness and about objects and history and his family is also white from East Texas and has a very particular long old history there. And, um, and he sends me these texts with images like, you didn't tell me you dug a hole. Like, when, when did you dig the hole? What did you find? I was like, what hole? I didn't dig a hole. Who dug a hole? So he, so I kind of came over to the opening and came outside and saw this perfect hole. <laughs> it's like perfectly round. It's perfect. And like, I had no answer for him. No idea who dug the hole or why it's here. I also have no idea why it's like perfectly artistically placed in like an amazing spot to do a gathering of people with me talking by the hole. Um, and that's like been this process the whole time. Like I don't understand what's happening. I don't know why it matters. I definitely cannot justify it. No, I mean, I have political and ethnical reasoning that we'll get into, I think, but um, yeah. So I wanted to invite y'all to come out and see this hole that I didn't dig, <laughs> that someone dug in a perfectly round fashion, like some kind of gift to me. And it's been that throughout the whole process that I end up at these sites. Often I don't know why I'm there, or I think it's just something historical with history and then I talk to my dad and it's like, fuck, like, who knew? Who knew that happened to you there? Who knew you did that there? Who knew all of these things? Um, and yeah, so before we go inside, what I'd like to ask you to do um, is go and um, do what I do when I do the unsettlements, which is just walk around the site um, and find one object if you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine. But if, if you could find objects and just also put them into the hole, that would be great. Thank you. I feel that same thing as you were talking about the history of this. Mm. Just right here across the street. Uh -huh. Just to be one of the biggest. <clears throat> and most busiest car washes in Houston. Oh, wow. My mom, Gloria, my They all work there. They no, all got their car washes. Oh. <laughs> and the bank, the black building that's over there. Yeah, that's over the bank of Houston. And then just, just I realized, like, I know all those places. You know all those places. Here's my objects. I've been looking at that for a while. <laughs> I like that object. Leaf. What was that? Oh my God. None of the dirt is here. Like, you know, they it's not there. The like, yeah. I, not I hadn't thought of that, but it's true. Like the sod is gone, the dirt is like gone. Would you take this one back inside for me? And would you take this one back inside for me? And I'll, I'll, I'll show you where to put it. Would you take this one back inside for me? Thank you. Would you take this one back inside for me? Yuka, would you take this one back? Take this one back inside for me. 
Would you take this one back inside for me? I'll, show, I'll, I'll tell you when to give it back to me, okay? okay? Thank you. Would you take this one back? Wow. We have to work with this one. It needs a little support. Oh my god. Do you want to take this one back inside for me? Thank you. It's a little fragile. Oh, this one's amazing. <laughs> Would you take this one back inside for me? Take this one back inside for me. Sure. Thank you. Would you take this one back inside for me? These guys are all friends. They're similar. Oh, I'm definitely taking those back inside. Okay, let's go back inside. Do you want me to? No. You can do it later, right? Sorry? You can buy it later, right? Okay. She said, she she said wait. If I gave you objects, you can bring them. You can bring it. You can bring it. Thank you. Thank you. I love this one. What color is it? I'm colorblind. Does anyone still have objects? You can bring it up. Is there a place you'd like to put it? Or do you want me to? Yeah. Do you want to put it down? Just anywhere? You get to decide. Do you want to put it? Where, anywhere here? You can. Or I can put it. Either one. Oh, I think you want to put it. No, 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 you can put it if you want. Okay. <laughs> I kind of was thinking of a way that I wanted it. But
เงินนักหนาหน่อยจะสนิทวันนี้มีอะไรอีกรูปฮัลโหลมีรูปเตียงฟรีอยู่ในฝั่งซ้ายซึ่งเราควรจะเอาฝั่งซ้ายไปที่ฝั่งซ้าย So welcome and thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm Laura. I think most of you know JP, um, and we're going to talk for a little bit about his work and about what just happened, and then I think we'll have a little bit of time to have a conversation um, with all of you, and then of course this is a project that unfolds. So um, it's not a one-time only ask the most important question kind of event. It's a kind of Ongoing conversation that I hope you'll continue to participate in with both of us. So, take a nice deep breath. I've been thinking about this work. We've been talking about this work for almost a year, not quite a year, about nine months, right? And I'm interested um, in its relationship to language for many reasons. Oh, who are you? I'm Laura. Should I introduce you? <laughs> no. This is Laura. August, um, who's the curator for the show here at City Singing, mm -hmm. um, and we is also a writer mm -hmm. um, and a curator and many other things, art therapist to many, um, and yeah, and I'm really happy to be here sitting with you and introducing you to the public. Thank you, that's very kind. Sure. So I'm interested in this work in relationship to language, to start with. I'm interested in it from from many directions, which you know, but I want to think about words first because. There's something that happens over and over again in the work in which you is especially interesting because you are also a writer and someone who translates and there's a resistance or a reluctance around words and around telling and so that's a decision that I think if we'll get into what exactly we're sitting amongst but if you're thinking about these works as having a relationship to something that's happened. I think a human impulse is to tell a story, and a human impulse is to ask what happens, right? What what does the site mean? And you don't allow us that somehow, right? You you kind of put some distance between that happening. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that impulse and why that is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I don't actually think about it as putting distance between you and the things, mm -hmm. or you and the objects, or you and the videos, or you and the book. I think about it as Um, kind of making an offering of objects, of images, and not forcing a particular conversation to happen. So, mm -hmm. um, so actually, like I think the work invites intimacy. Mm -hmm. Like I think it invites you to get closer. Yeah. What it doesn't do is insist that you get closer. Like it's not mm -hmm. in your face about this is this and this is this and this is this because. Each one of these is is um, standing in for a relationship with the site of trauma or violence that particularly affected family members. In this case, here, my dad and my dad's parents. Um, and so that process of coming to those stories hasn't been easy. Um, mm -hmm. It's been like a lifelong process of trying to get my dad to talk about things that were really painful and really difficult. Um, and that's come out little by little by little by little over many many years, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that many people can identify with. And trying to get to know your parents or your grandparents or the history of a place, mm -hmm. or that that process is slow. That process happens in fits and starts. Um, and so, I want to kind of honor the fact of that time that it took and mm -hmm. the intimacy that it took to come to those. Narratives, right? Mm -hmm. That that didn't happen in one day, um, and and so I want I want to give them space. Like I want to give them space to to breathe. I want to give them space to exist in their own way. I don't mm -hmm. want to pin them down so mm -hmm. hard that then there's only one reading that you can do. Also, some of these um, unsettlements. So there's eight of them. These are the kind of object poems on the walls. Um, 
some of them are events that if I told you what the event was, um, you would know because it's a, hitty, it's a history of the city, or you might know. Um, some people are better at municipal history than others. Um, some people have been here longer and have their own connections to those things. Some people just got here and don't have those, those stories. Um, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to allow folks to, to interact with them, thinking of their own memories, thinking of their own um, stories, um, and not necessarily impose or center that story of my dad um, mm -hmm. or of my own story in these. The other thing that happens a lot locally, if I, when you mention big historical events of great importance, um, everybody has a story about that and everybody has their own relationship to that. Um, and at least for these, um, I think at a later point the unsettlements might work on building spaces for bringing out other narratives of a particular site, but for this one it ended up in this way. And for people who are interested in going deeper, um, the book has a lot of story and narrative in it, mm -hmm. but the book is an intimate experience, right? Like a book is something that you have to decide to purchase mm -hmm. here or go and sit in the closet and read the book. Um, the original book is now in the closet. It'll be replaced by one of the printed copies now that the printed copies are made. So you can go and sit and read it, or you can take a copy home and you mm -hmm. can decide to read it on your own time. If you start reading and then you get triggered or there's something that's happening or you don't have space for it in your life at that moment, you just leave the book to mm -hmm. the side and then come back to it when you want. And, and so that felt really important to me. Mm -hmm. A lot of artists, I think, end up making things that are a little bit cryptic or conceptual, and then you have to go to the artist talk to like hear the stories behind it. Mm -hmm. And I actually knew that I didn't want to tell those stories here, sitting mm -hmm. with a group, or I didn't want to tell them when a byline reporter, byline Houston reporter came to interview me about it. Like, mm -hmm. that's not what I wanted to talk about um, mm -hmm. publicly in that way. If anyone reads the book and then wants to have a conversation about what they read, I'm mm -hmm. so open to that. I think uh -huh. that would be an amazing thing to have happen. Um, but I wanted to be conscious about the kind of space I was creating and about the kind of like connections that I was making or not making. Mm -hmm. I think there are p ways in which culturally we like to mark trauma and we often do so with memorials or with monuments. And often memorials and monuments are about naming, right? Are about putting a name to a thing that happened, um, naming a person that was lost, um, locating a site right and and placing something there so that it, so that it's it's held right and we have talked a lot about um monument you actually had a moment in which you were interested in possibly doing something like that and that will appear in the book and so you can kind of visit that that thinking through in the book um but i've as you're talking about intimacy as you're talking about the stories of your father this seems like a thing that is more about healing very specifically a kind of trauma that is passed through family, right? Which bigger sites are also, but in this case it's about this intergenerational thing that has happened that you don't want to hold in your body, that you don't want to kind of transmit to your daughter Correct. in that same way. And so I'm, I'm interested in what that process, how that process is feeling now after so many years, but also about these nine months. And also, how can, other, how can other families kind of come to that, that type of processing? Is this something that you're thinking about as like something transmittable to other people trying to do this work? Yeah. So yeah, I want to say really clearly that a lot of this work is about unearthing my own family members' involvement in um, mm -hmm. white supremacy here in Houston. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a like, wide array of, of, of things. Um, and it's, there's specifically in here, there's, there's white supremacy, there's misogyny, and there's heterosexism and homophobia, and traumas and violences that are marked in here related to that in the family. Um, and as often happens when you talk about trauma, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, I, I was just asking about that processing of trauma across a family, right. and then also how you think about it. Right. 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 So, 
So the relationships to those incidents of white supremacist violence or of heterosexism or homophobia or misogyny, my family members' relationships to those are, are complicated and different for each one of the sites. So with some of them, and I was really conscious about that and also conscious about not wanting to just retell the same story about white supremacy and the same story about homophobia and heterosexism and all of these things that, um, you know, most of y'all that are here are my friends. Like, y'all know that, those stories, right? And the, the people that I care about and the people that I want to talk to have some awareness of that. And, and I'm not saying that I never make, I mean, I do a lot of activist work and organizing work, and that work works in really different ways. Um, but this work is, a, like, sep it's a space for those memories, it's a space for grappling with that, and it's not a space for retelling that same old story that we're just mm -hmm. retelling and retelling. Sometimes, as a form of, of, like, if we just tell the story of all the horrible things that these white people did, or all the horrible things that these straight folks did, then somehow there will be a reparation that happens through that storytelling. And I think sometimes that's true, but it really matters who's doing the telling, right? Mm -hmm. So if I sit here, and walk through my family, uh, family member as victimizer, or my family member as witness, or my family member as spectator, or my family member as, um, as hero, or my family member as resistor, my family member as any of these things, I feel like it instantly, mm -hmm. you're instantly going to have the emotional response that you have to hearing a white person tell that story of that white, mm -hmm. that white story. Um, and so I, I, I wanted, I think it's vitally important to tell those stories, and I actually, um, but I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to do it in the same way. I don't know mm. if it's successful or not, but it was what I mm. needed to do. I also, I mean, I'm uncomfortable with some of the decisions that I made. I'm uncomfortable in some ways about how intimate this work is, um, because, like, I went to the Camp Logan um, Jefferson Pinder's event, Pinder event this week on Thursday, and that event is like taking on a historical event in a very active way, right? Recreating the march of African-American soldiers from Camp Logan to Fourth Ward in a, in a rebellion in 1917 in which they killed, I think, 17 white folks and then with no, uh, with no real trial were hung in San Antonio. Um, and, and that, performance enacts that in a public way, in a visceral way, in a community way, bringing people together to do that. And I think that work is amazing. And I wasn't gonna do that kind of work, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's, that's not what I needed to do. That's not, that, that wasn't the space that I needed to make. And, and I still have questions about, um, about what that is or what that does. But I'm also aware that like, when I started this work, I set out I, I normally do collective work, and I normally do, I do a lot of collective work, and I work with language. And so with the mm -hmm. studio space here, this year, I wanted to do something where I didn't use language in the same ways that I always do. So the book actually only happened like five weeks ago, six weeks, six weeks before the opening. So it's more than that now. But, um, but I knew I wanted to, to, to try out some other ways of working or some other ways of getting to this material. Um, because they're also the reason these stories, or the, what was the lack of stories 20 years ago, um, are what brought me back to the city. So I was born here, and my family has deep roots here, but I didn't grow up here. Um, and I moved back in 2001 on a roots trip to try and like, figure out who my people were and where I was from. And, and if I was going to be doing all of this organizing work, I needed to know, like, what did my people do? Like, what are these generational things that... That, that, that I'm coming down the pike with, right? Or whenever I walk into a room, I'm bringing those ancestors into the room with me. Like, I really believe that, that they're sitting there with all of their horrible things and all of their positive things. And so, um, so this is also about doing that work that I think white people need to do, of digging into, like, who, who your people is, right? There's a Sharon Bridgeforth podcast called Who Your People Is. And I think that's important work. Um, but it's very uncomfortable to center that or like even have an event around that. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's a failed proposition, but I'd rather mm -hmm. fail at it 
um, than yeah. not try. And I think the reason also to do the work is, is for my dad and with my dad. Um, so this has been a process with him and a process of reckoning with him. Um, so I, I want to go to failure. Okay. Because <laughs> I know, I love failure. <laughs> no, I want to think about failure because um, I, I'm drawn, so I've been thinking about that Heather Love book that came out several years ago called The, Art of, the Queer Art of Failure, right? And so thinking about how, if we're talking about history with a capital H, this, this is a failure, right? Because you're not telling us dates, you're not telling us names, you're not making reparations. There's not a kind of resolve and a heroic conclusion. You're not telling us the importance of these sites. There's no marker. And there's something so important about failure um, as a querying of history, as a querying of how we understand these spaces to work, how we understand whiteness to work. And I wonder if maybe I'm conflating two things and we could separate those things out. But I want to talk about that with you. Yeah. I mean, I think whiteness and queerness are always conflated in my body, right? Like mm -hmm. You can't separate those things out. You can't, mm -hmm. like, only be a victim of homophobia as a white person or only be a victim, like, there's, there's always that relationship to white supremacy. There's always that, um, that there. But I, I do really like to think of this work as queer. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the work that I've done over the years is, like, to me, really queer, but I never talk about it as queer. Mm -hmm. In the past, I've never really like foregrounded that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as I get older, that becomes like more and more important to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just being at home and like thinking about mm -hmm. this work, like that that queerness. I'm just gonna say is like intergenerational, right? Like this, I'm not the first generation, and I have learned a lot of stories that I've gotten some access to about that. And so that feels important to talk about and to hold up and to recognize um, and also not deal with that in a way that's at all separate from the horrors of white supremacy that my family participated in, benefited from, um, was involved in. Like All of that feels really critical. Um, and I think the smallness of it too, the like, I hope some humility about like one's um, capacity to like, do something actually like I, I I like the idea of the work being small or humble or quiet, mm -hmm. um, and that's and I, I think that's tied to queerness in some way. Like mm -hmm. I think that there's um, I don't know. Like I don't have it all worked out, but I I actually like I mean I I end up thinking a lot about them in on those terms and. Mm -hmm. Um, in the book, there's um, notes from a lot of the studio visits that I did with folks over the course of the nine months. So um, one of the people that came was JT Tamayo, who mm -hmm. is a performance artist who was doing a performance here in town and also a poet, interdisciplinary artist. And, um, and they came to the studio and one of the things they said was like, as um, white folks or non-black people of color, if you don't talk about white supremacy or forward, put that forward when you're talking about your work, like to them it was suspect, mm -hmm. right? And, and, I, and I don't know if I would go that far, but I knew in my own work that I wanted to foreground that. And then I asked them, they did a very queer performance, La Cuidadora, mm -hmm. um, which was like a taking of Dora the Explorer and queering her and deracinating her and doing all kinds of like amazing things with costumes and glitter and, <laughs> and like super queer. Yeah. And so seeing it, it also made me like feel insecure about like, fuck, my work isn't queer enough. Once again, I'm doing this work mm -hmm. that's like vaguely queer and ambiguously, maybe you can connect it. Like, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm kind of at a point where I'm just like, no, I, I want to say it's queer, and I don't know exactly why. But I asked JT, like, how could I queer it up a little bit? <laughs> like, what could I do? Because <laughs> I want maybe some, what glit, I don't know, like colors. <laughs> and, and she's like, or they're like, um, they said, no, like, you're doing time travel. You're doing, mm -hmm. like, you're traveling through time. You're, you're moving, you're failing, you're attempting to grapple with things that are too big to deal with, you're, you're coming in at the wrong moment, mm -hmm. like, you're always, like, you're never there at the right time, like, whenever you think you're on top of something, it all slips away mm -hmm. again, like, that's fucking being queer, right? Or like, we can't even 
all the words are changing so fast that we all have to like reanalyze ourselves every day about like who we are and gender and sexuality. And so there's some, and history, right? Like how do we even make sense of history? How do you make sense of people, you know, who in the early 20th century in Houston who like never came out or never had words to talk about that? And how do you recognize them as like sisters or siblings or like how do you, so, once again, the work doesn't provide any answers to that, but I, 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 I hope it asks some of those questions. I think one of the beautiful ways it approaches that is through what you are calling ritual, right? right? Yeah. So we talk a lot about these things speaking to you or about them holding knowledge about kind of these um, formerly living materials, right? Being, being able to speak and being able to tell you something being able to at least make sound somehow, which sound was really important to me in thinking about this whole show. Like, what is the sound of Houston in so, from so many different places, from so many different kinds of sites that are overlooked and missed as we kind of commute back and forth? Um, and I, I, I'm curious, I, I'm curious what it felt like to make a kind of ritual outdoors right now. If, maybe it's too soon to say, but what it felt like to finally open up a ritual to other people when they've been so personal. Right. Yeah, so one of the things that, I've, so for one, um, the, one of the other reasons why I wanted to make the book was because um, I wouldn't be doing this work without the work of folks like Andrea Roberts, who's doing African American um, uh, community work and planning work around settler, uh, around uh, Afri Freedmen's, Freedmen's colonies um, across East Texas and across Texas, mm -hmm. or someone like Monica Munoz Martinez, who's um, has a book called The Injustice Never Leaves You, where she's digging into the histories of Texas Rangers, violence in, East Te in South Texas and West Texas. Or Cecilia Vicuña, who, like, I always go back to her. Um, and, um, I mean, yeah, anyone that, uh, Stalina Villarreal, who was here for the opening, came up and was like, well, obvio, es Cecilia Vicuña. Which, yeah. right, like, she's everywhere in here and everywhere in my thinking. Um, and she has a, a line that uh, un ritual es la transformación de la, realidad, de la realidad. A ritual is the transformation of reality. So like a ritual is able to transform the reality that we take for granted, or the, the reality that we think we know, or that we think we see, that, that we, we think we experience something that's real. And so a, a ritual or a, a performance, an intervention in that way, like hopefully is able to like transform that reality in some way for at least that minute. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know, as I was thinking about what to do on the lot, I went through a lot of different things. It was very uncomfortable for me to not just read something, because I'm a mm -hmm. poet, and that's how I've gotten to this point, is through mm -hmm. um, poetry and translation. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to think about um, just talking, um, because um, I saw this performance some years ago, Simone Forti, who was this amazing mm -hmm. um, dancer. She did these improvisations um, in San Diego um, that where she um, moved around, um, just had a stool like this, and then like moved inside and out of it and just talked as she was doing it. And that performance has just stick, stuck with me for so many years because um, there's something about just being in the moment and being able to talk, and then also being able to be quiet. Um, that I really want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And so I tried. Yeah. We're going to end our conversation with the first poem you made. But actually, I wonder if we could have a moment to not talk and take a breath. And then if any of you have a question that you'd like to make after that deep breath, then there's space for that. Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, so you were talking about grammar and the family's history of white and white supremacy, and using that as like a kind of form of like using that within like the foundations of the book that you're creating. And I kind of just wanted to like make a statement like, you know, a lot of people don't want to look at that type of stuff, you know, like famous people that go on that, like, um, what is it, like 
thing where they do like the background checks of everyone, like the ancestry thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And like the people will be like, well, I don't want anyone to know that my, my family owned slaves or anything like that. But like to just discover it and then make that like uh, transparent is, I think, pretty great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I didn't have a question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. talk about, um, I'm interested in the um, kind of unearthing of information um, with your father. So um, can you talk about what you discovered, but also the, um, because it's, I know how you work too, that it's not just like you expect to arrive at this place, but um, how what what you unearthed, but how that what that revealed to your father, yeah. and how he responded, opened up. How was he through the process? Yeah. I'm interested in the discoveries, right. but also kind of the reception of these discoveries, and that kind of you know this loop that might have happened in, in um, you know possible reciprocity. Yeah. So um, so all of that is in the book, Ayana. <laughs> yeah. All those fragments, all those little pieces of the story in the book, um, you'll see that typeface and font is really important. When it's the font that's like uh, called block lettering, um, that's most often the voice of my father talking. So, and that was block lettering that he used. He, he went to U of H for 15 years off and on. Um, like a good working class kid, like trying to pull together the money, trying to support his family, trying to go to school, trying to be in the 60s in Houston, and, and um, it went to like petroleum engineering classes and vector algebra, and he did a whole bunch of different studies. Um, but he learned those black letters, and he um, fell in love with them. And it's something that he's always done. He's very proud of those letters. Um, my father also uh, was a writer um, up to the age of 25 when he decided to burn all of the writing that he had written up to that point. Um, and he burned a lot of other stuff that day too. Mm -hmm. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. And then he kept burning it um, and kept hiding the ashes. Um, and here I come along, you know, 50 years later. Like, so what, what was on those papers and what did you do? And he told me all of them were written in those block letters, um, except the stuff that he was going to send away to magazines that was written with a typewriter. Um, and he built a box for it um, because at that time, he says in the book, you, can't, you couldn't go to the store and buy like, cute things that you needed for your house. Like, you just had to make them. And so he knew exactly what he wanted, so he built this box with, with um, with, with legs, and then on top there was a, a, a record player. And inside the box he would put all the papers. So that day when he burned it on Lawson Street in the East End, eight blocks away from where I live now, he took it outside in the backyard and burned it all. And he never looked back. Um, I asked him, uh, this process has been hard for him, it's been difficult. There's a page in the book that says I'm still spinning in kind of a degraded block letter. And it's degraded because uh, on several days, we would go out and do these unsettlements together. And he came up to me one night at the end and said, like, I'm just so, like, I don't know what we did. It was really intense. And I'm still spinning. Like, I can't find my footing. And so, and I asked him later in the studio to, to write that for me, like, in his letters as they are now, which he can't do the block letters anymore because he had a stroke two years ago. And so they're written in, like, the best lettering he could do. And I kept asking him to write more. To, he would say, like, if you send me emails, I'll answer them. He never would. Um, and I asked him, he was here for the opening with my mom. Um, and I asked him prior to that, like, what can I do with the stories? Um, you know, what, and when I was making the book, like, how much can I share? How much can I not? And he said, you know, these stories are yours now. Like, you can do with them whatever you want. Like, and he, and I said, but it's all about you. And he said, no, it's not. It's, about, it's actually about you. Um, and, and in some ways, I do feel like I ended up writing. I mean, this book is for him. Um, for, for me, it's like the book, that, the book that I hope that he would have written, mm -hmm. or the book like, that I can imagine. Um, 
I went to Ayana's talk today with her dad, um, and Ayana's, Ayana also has a body of work at the Gregory Lincoln School right now that she made with her father, who's an accomplished artist and sign painter. And it was so profound to listen to the two of you talk because as my father was a failed artist, right? Like, and, and my father made really different decisions about how to live. Um, and like you said, like, there's something about the book too that like, I want to look back on those things that he buried, right? And, and they are available to you now, but they're in the book. I'm not going to talk about him. I'm just not. <laughs> and he asked for me ne not to talk about them next to him not to force him to stand next to those stories in public. So like the kind of thing that you were able to do to sit with your dad and like talk about this stuff and that he has his own practice and I mean that's just, it just blew my mind. Like, and it also made me realize like all of these other layers of what I've been doing, right? That I didn't really understand. Like, and I think I still don't really understand. Because um, one day, like, my daughter will read the book, right? And she's, she'll look at it and try and figure out, what is that? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what were those stories? So. so my question is similar to the one before, because it was about what have you learned about your father, what have you learned, but this one is what have you learned about you? <laughs> because of this process of being so powerful, it's really always about you. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, my father at the end of the process, and this is also in the book, um, I have my own trauma in my own life and my own stories of trauma and violence and, and facing that. Um, and I'm very private about that. Surprise. <laughs> um, not that any of this is generational, right? Like, we don't end up making the same decisions that our parents made about how to deal with trauma, right? <laughs> I'm doing a book about his trauma, not about mine. <laughs> Um, but there is one point where it comes up, um, because in a conversation with him, um, we were doing these like Google Hangout chats, um, and I was like recording them, so I have some of these little snippets recorded on my computer. And at the end, there's a section where all of these things pop up that he said. And the one about my trauma is upside down, so you really have to work if you want to read it. Um, because my dad brought it up mm -hmm. and was basically like, it made him rethink our relationship and the things that he now knows that I went through and his own relationship to that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, the, I mean, I don't think anything is ever just about you, right? Like, there's no such thing as an I. Like, I really don't believe there's an individual. Like, we're just matter that's like circulating through the universe that happens to be in this form. And we have this really fun illusion that we're like one person that's not connected to other things. And, and it's just not true, right? Like, if you think about, like, Carrizo Comecrudo's teachings and, like, teachings of indigenous people of this land, which Eddie Garcia is with the Carrizo Comecrudo tribe, like, you know, if you, talk to, if you talk to local indigenous folks, like, that's not how we live, right? Or a Kim Talbear is another person that's in the book and that influences my thinking a lot. Like, so a lot of this is also about, like, what happens if I just listen to all of these um, like African-American thinkers, Mexican-American, indigenous thinkers, like, and really like, apply that back on myself in a way that my mom called brutal at one point. She's like, you're brutal with us. Like, you're, this is a brutal process. Um, and I think there is some, like, you know, this is an unsettlement. Like, it's supposed to be unsettling. It's supposed to, it's supposed to do these things. Um, and I totally forgot the question. No, it's about how much did you learn about you? I mean, and all then, of those uh, things. Because yeah. you said you were doing this for your daughter, right? You know? Well, and I also, yeah. I think part passing of it too. Passing the trauma. Yeah, well, trying not to pass not the trauma. Exactly. Right, like trying to deal with it in a way where like she doesn't have to just, you know, like just drink all this in her water, right? Like that like, because I'm not the first generation in my family to grapple with white supremacy or to attempt to deal with this either. Like that also is generational. Like the harm is generational, and like we're not the first white people to try and like end this, right? So like, why did all of them fail too, right? Like there have been other generations of white people that tried to tried to end this. So like, and I think part of it is this trauma that like we just keep passing down to each other that's really complicated and I don't have my head around it, but I've learned something about that. And I've also, 
I've also, like, I don't think I gave myself the space until now, 39 years old, to like actually do a project that's, that's working on my family and my stuff. Um, I did a lot of collective work. I did a lot of organizing work and interpreting work. And some of those folks are here that are part of the Antena Houston Collective, Jose Eduardo. And, um, and so it took a long time to give myself permission to just follow my gut and carve out space in my life to do that. Because, um, right, when like, kids are being locked up in cages and like, black folks are being killed in the street and like, you know, trans, black trans women are being killed at a horrifying rate every day, like, why would I go and talk to my dad about stuff that happened 50 years ago? Or like, what right do I have to do that? Like, shouldn't my time be better spent? Um, and I let that go, at least for nine months, to just be like, no, I don't know why, what this is doing, or I don't know how this is working, but, so something about like, I don't know, I want to think that I should follow my gut. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. One note about this space in the exhibition is that it's a bit difficult to pin together the unsettlements with the videos that you've made. Yeah. But you can if you're very careful and you kind of dig a little bit. There's a list of the works and it's in the order that you walk through. And so each unsettlement is numbered and then each video from the Instagram stories corresponds to a numbered unsettlement. And that's the closest that you'll get really to it. Here is this. And in the book. Right. I draw each one of the unsettlements as it was in the studio and number mm -hmm. it underneath. Mm -hmm. There's like a lot of, yeah. And in the catalog, which will come out soon, there's also a, an image or two from the studio and there, yeah. But I, I want to end by thinking for a moment about unsettlement one, okay. which is here. And if you, I don't know what you would like to share with us about yeah. what it is, um, but for me, I think about this as the closest thing to a piece of language in some ways. Um, and as you're ending with Unsettlement 1, which is the first thing, um, I think we'll end with a song. Yeah, there's a song. And before we do that, I want to thank all of you so much for being here. It's really powerful to be in a room full of JP's community while we talk about this work. And so um, I'm grateful for that space that just happened. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. Yeah. Uh, I'm very thankful for all of you for coming out. and. Yeah, it's, it's so nice to have like a lot of people from a lot of different parts of my life mm -hmm. and to share this. Um, so the last thing, this one, which is unsettlement number one, it's the first one I did in October. Um, I didn't know I was doing an unsettlement. I, um, my uh, father's parents are buried in Forest Park Cemetery on Lawndale in the East End by the bayou, by Bray's Bayou. Um, and I go there on occasion just to like sit and spend time with them. Um, I take my daughter. I've gone with my father a million times because whenever he's in town, he wants to put flowers there. Um, and I'd gone out there one day because I knew I was starting this project, um, but I didn't know what this project was or why I was doing it or what was going on. So I just went out there and like sat and hung out and ended up taking some pictures, taking some Instagram stories of like nature, Ayana, <laughs> of Spanish moss and leaves and grass. Um, and then I ended up collecting some Spanish moss and some leaves from the grave site and bringing them back. And one of the things I was thinking about was uh, Carrizo Come Crudo teaching that we, when we worked on a project some years back that, um, that Juan Mancias shared, which is that the land that we're walking on is um, full of um, all of the indigenous people who lived here for millennia before the arrival of settler colonists like myself. And so to be aware of that, and then also for that specific tree, that like that tree is drawing nutrients from the bodies of my grandparents. So like that Spanish moss, those leaves um, are there. And I didn't know what I was doing that day, but then I ended up using that procedure at all of these other sites. And the large leaves, there's oak leaves there, and then there's um, these other smaller leaves on top and then bigger leaves on the bottom. And those are begonias um, that my, um, this is the, this I think is the only exception to the rule. Um, I love exceptions to rules. Um, so that begonia is a begonia that my uh, father's mother took care of um, in that same house on, on Lawson Street in the East End. 
which she then passed to my dad, and then my dad has passed to me, and I've passed to a bunch of friends and, um, and other people and to my daughter. Um, and it spells out um, the words of a song that I'm going to play. Um, in the studio, I had just made one. Um, I just made one that, I, that wasn't tied to anything, but then when I needed to bring it down here into the show, I was thinking about what to base it on, um, and there's this, clay, there's this song called Clay Pigeons by Blaze Foley. It's like an old Texas country singer. Um, and um, Lester and I went to see the movie together. Um, and, um, and so it's a song that I always put on. It's very melancholic. You're going to get to hear it. Um, but there's this one section, um, which is, uh, so it starts at the top. So it's actually the number of syllables. I like scanned it. I'm a poet. Um, and then analyze the like uh, rhyme scheme. So where you see the leaves is the rhyme scheme. So I'm tired of running and looking for answers to questions that I already know. I could build me a castle of memories just to have somewhere to go. No, go. Count the days and the nights that it takes just to get back in the saddle again. He says again. Feed the pigeon some clay, turn the night into day. Start talking again, again, when I know what to say. Mm. And I'll just play the song, the song and then we'll end. <clears throat> Link to Bluetooth. Say y'all, feed the pigeons, turn 
like to be Stop talking again when I know what to say Good one. That's a good one. Wait, wait. Shall we wince? Shall we wince? <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>